You may be seated. Friday night, they're going to have a Sudan update here. Safe Harbor and Samaritan Purse Ministry will both have guests here who will be telling us the latest in the Sudan. The Christians who are being persecuted there, a sad, sad situation. We were up at the uh, conference center at Twin Peaks with the family camp and are they having a time? And it's just absolutely beautiful. And uh, we will be having another family camp. Uh, there were so many on the waiting list that couldn't get in. We decided to have another family camp next week. And so if you would like to go with your family, be sure to sign up in the office. It is just exciting. The facility is just spectacular, beautiful. You'll love it and uh, guaranteed wonderful time spiritually being enriched as well as just a wonderful time of fellowship and enjoying God's creation uh, there in the mountains. And so uh, you can get information in the office concerning the uh, family camp next week. The following week, it's scheduled out for Huntington Beach, Calvary Chapel. Uh, they called and said that they are not going to have the numbers of people that they were hoping for. So if anybody wanted to go the following week, that also will be open. And so you can again sign up in the office for either of the next two weeks of the family camps up there. Get in on the ground floor. And as I say, you're going to really enjoy uh, the uh, way the facility now looks and just, uh, well, you'll just have to see it. You can't describe it. So take advantage. Okay, let's turn to the 14th chapter of the book of Acts. At the end of chapter 13, we find the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women there in Antioch. They raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. So uh, they didn't leave on the most pleasant terms. Uh, they were being expelled out of their coast. And the disciples, however, uh, were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. These two things seem to go together, uh, the joy and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, but joy is love's consciousness. Paul wrote to the Romans, for the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Again to Romans, he said, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So whenever you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you should be talking about joy. And uh, if your life is filled with the Spirit, then it should show on your face. Uh, and it should show in your life the joy of the Lord and uh, how wonderful it is to experience and to know that joy in the Lord, the joy that comes through the abiding of the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Though there was a lot of affliction, yet because of the Holy Spirit, there was joy. And so they left Antioch under duress, being persecuted by the Jews, and they came to Iconium. Now this is a journey of about 90 miles from 
uh, Antioch to uh, Iconium. And they went, both of them, together into the synagogue of the Jews. And of course, this was their typical method of operation, to go into the synagogue when they came to a new city. The fact that there were synagogues in these areas, which are rather remote areas in the world, they were in the area of Galatia, which was pretty much a uh, Wild West kind of an environment. And, and the further they go, the wilder it gets. Uh, they're, they're going to the frontiers now. And uh, it's uh, a, a very um, dangerous place that they're going because uh, in the major cities, the Roman law ruled. And for the most part, it was fairly just. But when you would get into these remote areas, uh, it was more of a mob rule. But the interesting thing, of course, is that there were synagogues in these remote areas, which illustrates to what extent the Jews were dispersed uh, when Titus came with the Roman troops and uh, they were dispersed throughout the world. Uh, but of course, they had been dispersed earlier under the Babylonian and Assyrian captivity. So you find the little pockets of Jews synagogues in each of these little uh, remote areas of the old world. And so uh, when they would go to a synagogue, and part of their reason for going was that the Jews knew the scriptures. They didn't have to start with the ABCs of the existence of God and God's revelation of himself. And they didn't have to rehearse all of the uh, beginning principles of the Bible. The Jews knew them. The Jews knew the scriptures. And thus, if they converted a Jew, they were already schooled in the scriptures and they could go right out and begin to teach and to win others. The thing that they were doing was proving from the scriptures that the Messiah was to suffer and was to die but would rise again. This is the part of the scriptures that the Jews had more or less spiritualized and thus ignored. Because they could not reconcile the disparity between the Messiah ruling over the world and establishing God's kingdom upon the earth with the Messiah suffering and dying, they spiritualized all of the scriptures that spoke of his suffering and death. And of course, this is the danger of spiritualizing scriptures because you can take them completely out of their meaning. You can, in spiritualizing them, uh, make them to say anything you want them to say. Uh, and, and there are many people that say, well, now, this is a type of, it isn't, you know, really, but it's a type of, and, and you can just go off and and, and Preach your own thing when you're spiritualizing the scriptures. God really didn't mean what he said. Uh, what he really meant was, you know, well, the moment you do that, you, you really lose the meaning. God did mean what he said, and God meant what he said. And, and you can read it, and the plain, obvious meaning is the correct meaning. Uh, the danger of spiritualizing. The, you know, you could take, say, old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. Now, the cupboard represents the 
storehouse that a person has, the richness of the scriptures. And it's so important that you have a good understanding, a solid foundation that when there is a need, you can always go and find something there. Of course, this poor dog uh, was, you know, and, and so you can start spiritualizing. You can make the thing, you know, mean anything or, or say anything. And, and that's the danger of spiritualizing scriptures by saying, well, no, that's not really what it means. Uh, and that's what they were doing with the scriptures that dealt with the suffering of the Messiah. Isaiah 53, they totally spiritualized that. And the suffering servant became the nation of Israel that suffered such persecution. But when you read it in its context, all we like sheep have gone astray. We turned every one of us to our own way, and God laid on him the iniquities of us all. Uh, did God lay the iniquities of all the world upon Israel? For the transgression of my people, God said, he was smitten. And, and they went spiritualizing this, missed completely the fact that the Messiah was going to suffer. He was going to die. So all Paul had to do with the Jews is to go through those scriptures, their scriptures, that dealt with the suffering of the Messiah, the death of the Messiah, and his rising again. And in so doing, once they saw in the scriptures that this was to happen to the Messiah, then he could show them that this is exactly what happened to Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was the stone which the builders set at naught, but God has made him the chief corner. And so uh, he would go to the Jews. He would point out those scriptures that spoke of the Messiah being rejected, being put to death, rising again, and then he would show that Jesus fulfilled those very things and show from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. When they saw that, immediately they were prepared to go out and to teach others because they knew the scriptures. Now they have a correct understanding of the interpreting of those scriptures, and thus they are tailor-made evangelists to go out and share the truth with the world. Now you convert a Gentile, he doesn't know the scriptures. He knows there must be a God, but he is not aware that God has revealed himself to man. He's not aware of how God has revealed himself, how that man can have a relationship with God and so forth. And so you have to start right at the beginning and, and go through the basics and teach them the basics, bringing them on up through the Old Testament to the coming of Jesus Christ. And so uh, it, it took much longer. When Paul was in Ephesus, he stayed there for a period of uh, over a year and a half uh, because they needed to be founded in the truth. They needed a strong foundation. And uh, it was basically a Gentile church. And, and thus it took much longer to establish them than when you would convert a Jew to the gospel. And so for this reason, in their first missionary journeys, they would always find where the Jews were assembling, the synagogue, if there were one. And the moment you had 10 adult males, it was necessary to have a synagogue. 10 Jewish adult males. And so uh, they would go to the synagogue and uh, they followed this method of operation in each area where they would go. They so spake, Luke tells us, that great multitudes, both of Jews and Greeks, believed. They so spake. How did they speak? They spoke with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in the words. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, as I declared to you the testimony of God. For I was determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. So Paul is declaring to them that my preaching, it was the demonstration of the spirit and power. There was great power attending the teaching of the word in those days. Uh, the, the testimony of the scripture is of the power that was there. Uh, now we read that the unbelieving Jews stirred the Gentiles. Wherever you see God working, multitudes believed, but wherever you see God working, you can be sure that Satan is going to try to counteract the work of God. It would be naive to think that if God is doing a mighty work, that Satan is not going to try to throw a monkey wrench into the work that God is doing to stir up strife, to stir, stir up division. Unfortunately, we have seen many mighty works of God destroyed because Satan stirred up people and the work split and it, it, it's tragic to see a work of God destroyed by Satan. Jesus said to his disciples, it's impossible for offenses not to come, but woe unto him through whom they come. You're not going to please everybody. Paul said, for if I pleased everyone, I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. So offenses will come. I received a letter just the other day of some lady who came to Calvary years ago and was so totally offended by what I said that she went out angry and, and, and told of the anger that she's held many years, you know, against me and hatred and everything else that she had because what I said, she didn't tell me what I said, I don't know, but uh, it made her mad. <laughs> She was offended. And, and the Bible says offenses are going to come. Jesus said that. It's impossible not to offend. But woe unto those through whom the offenses come. Make sure that you're not the instrument that Satan is using to bring division within the body. Very important. Woe unto them through whom the offenses come. These Jews that began to stir up the Gentiles made their minds evil affected against the brethren. They deliberately sought to turn the people against Paul and Barnabas. And Satan will use lies, he'll use slander, or any other means whereby to accomplish his purposes. And uh, I've observed an evil in our day that is very similar to the evil in Jesus' day that Jesus spoke about and said, And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God, 
that you might keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And whosoever curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, Now, this is korban. That is to say, this is a gift. It's for your benefit then you can say whatever you want and you're free. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother. He doesn't have to support them anymore. This is a gift for you. You need to learn to be on your own. Making the word of God, Jesus said, of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and by such things you do. I have observed people today that will say, you know, I really love them, but, and then they'll go and they'll viciously slander and cut the person to pieces, and they'll say, but I really love them. Well, that's just like saying, Corban, go jump in the lake. That's for your good. That's a gift for you, Corban, you know. And, well, I really love them. And then you tear them to pieces. No, that isn't love. And, and that won't pass. That won't, uh, that won't do. And you're only deceiving yourself by declaring, oh, but I really love them. And then turning around and tearing them to pieces with your words. Oh, they're really a wonderful person, but... Oh, they're a good friend, but. Or he's a great preacher, but. And, and, you know, by prefacing it with sort of a compliment or a declaration of love, uh, then turning around and tearing them to pieces is just like those who were transgressing the laws of God by their traditions saying, if they would only preface it to their parents and say, now this is Corban, then they could curse them or do anything else as long as this is a gift. I'm giving you a gift, you know. We read that they stayed there for a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord. A long time, therefore, they remained. Now, interesting, we don't know how long they were planning to stay there. But here are many people who have believed. They're babes in Christ. They're new converts. The Jews are now stirring up trouble. They're trying to create trouble. So rather than just fleeing from the place, this is what caused them to determine to stay there for quite a while in order that they might ground the new believers in the faith. Rather than running from the opposition, they remained even longer to combat it. And it said they were speaking boldly. <laughs> Proverbs tells us that the wicked flee when no man pursues but the righteous are bold as a lion. In Acts 4.29, And now, Lord, the disciples pray, Behold their threatenings, that is, the counsel, and grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word by stretching forth your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Paul asked the Ephesians to pray for him that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which he said, I am an ambassador in bonds and therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. To the Thessalonians, he said, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, 
We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God, though there was much contention. And it said, who gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. God gave really testimony to the word through his grace and with signs and wonders. Writing to the Romans, Paul said, For I will not dare to speak of those things which Christ has not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Paul talks about the signs that followed his preaching, the working of the Holy Spirit, mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. To the Thessalonians, he said, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and with much assurance as you know what manner of work men we were among you for your sake. And uh, of course, Jesus, or not Jesus, well, he said that you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. But in the last verse of Mark's gospel, it tells us of the disciples, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, amen. In the book of Hebrews, the question is asked, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord was confirmed unto us by those that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Now the question, why don't we have today these signs and wonders and miracles accompanying the preaching of the word? I ask the question, I don't really have a definitive answer. I ask the question myself, Lord, why is it? that we don't have the signs and the wonders that they had when they went out to preach the gospel. There are those who say, well, that was given to the church initially to more or less help the church get a jump start because the world that they were taking the gospel to uh, was a world that was filled with cynicism concerning the things of God. It was a world that didn't really know God, the true and the living God, and thus they needed that extra power in the beginning. Well, if that is the reason why they needed the power, surely we need the power today because we're living in a cynical world that really doesn't know the Lord. So that doesn't really wash completely. I'm not ready to fault God for the lack of power in the church today. I do not believe it is because God no longer wants to demonstrate his power. I can't believe that. I would believe that the fault does not lie with God, but the fault lies with us. We read in the scriptures when Jesus was at Nazareth, he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The unbelief that does exist today 
in our culture, in our society, could surely be a hindering factor to the powerful work of God. But I do believe that because of the day and age in which we live, it is much more difficult to have the same kind of communion and fellowship with God that they had in those days. I believe that our minds are so crowded with other things that God has a hard time getting through to us. Whenever Paul went anywhere, he had to walk or went by ship, but and that was a slow ship too, sailing ships. He had come from Antioch onto Iconium. That's a distance of 90 miles. It's about as far as it is from here to San Diego. Now, if you want to get to San Diego, I dare say that you wouldn't go down to the beach and start walking along the beach to go to San Diego. You'd be more apt to get in your car and get on the five freeway and just head south. Dodging traffic, going in and out, and think of all of the computations your brain has to make as you're driving from here to San Diego. Looking at the traffic, your brain is computing how rapidly you are approaching the car in front of you. When you should turn the lane, you look in your rear view mirror to see if it's safe to turn into the other lane. And uh, your brain is making all of these computations. Your brain is very busy. And so you get to San Diego and you're not all relaxed and just kick back and say, oh, well, isn't this beautiful? We have right here at Mission Beach. How beautiful. But you're tense. You're upset. You think that <laughs> rotten driver back there, you know, almost ran me off the road, you know. And, you know, and it, it isn't conducive to real meditation and fellowship with God. In fact, you dare not do that when you're driving. Think of how much meditation and all Paul could do walking 90 miles from Antioch to Iconium. I mean, you could just walk along and, and, and you know, you're seeing the beauty of God's creation and all of the time to just enjoy the fellowship with God as you're going along. When we were over in Arian Jaya at a missions conference where we were speaking, we had a young fellow come up to us. He was actually from Garden Grove. And he was telling us about uh, the mission station that he had it was 30 miles to the closest grocery store. So when he wanted to get groceries, he had to go 30 miles, but the thing was, there were no roads. So he would walk along the beach, the 30 miles along the beach. He said he would put on his Walkman and put on the Maranatha praise tapes and just walk on the beach the 30 miles. He said it's some of the most beautiful beach in all the world. And he said, I just worship the Lord and just rejoice and listen to the tapes and just enjoy thoroughly that 30 mile walk. He said, Imagine. Me, a surfer from California, where does God put me? But 
next to some of the greatest beaches in the world and there's nobody there but me to enjoy it, you know. I can imagine that 30 miles walking along the beach, you could draw pretty close to the Lord. Time to think, time to meditate, time to open your heart to Him and to the Holy Spirit. You know, if we have to go two blocks, you wouldn't think of walking. <laughs> Get in the car and go. And, and that's just our geared up lifestyle, our geared up culture. And then if you did it, you'd probably want to take a radio with you so you could be filling your brain with music or something else while you're going. We don't know how to meditate, to just sit back and relax and open our minds and hearts to the Lord, to allow Him to minister and to allow Him to speak to us. And so I think that the culture in which we live mitigates against this kind of power that they had there in the early church. It's not that it isn't available. It isn't that God doesn't want to. It's just that we are not in the place in relationship where God can do what he wants to do. I believe that living in our culture and in this day and age, it would be difficult for God to find a man that would use those same gifts of power who would not use those gifts to glorify himself rather than to glorify God. We see those on television who assertively have gifts. And we see that their lifestyle is so to bring glory and attention, their very mannerisms on the platforms bring such attention and glory to them. Oh, they may say praise the Lord and all, but yet the way they, they move, the way they act, it's all to get attention. And then they're trying to enrich themselves through these things. They try to justify, you know, $250 shoes and things like that uh, because of, you know, the number of people that they're able to attract. They name their ministries after themselves. They name their schools or universities after themselves. And they seem to be more interested in promoting themselves than they are the Lord. And then they seek to enrich themselves through the use of the gifts that God has given and so much of the money is used for high living. And yet they're constantly begging people for funds to promote their great faith ministry. God wants to work, I'm certain of that. But it, all, it seems like it is always difficult for God to find an instrument through which he can work that will truly give the glory to him. It would take a very great commitment to Jesus Christ not to prostitute the sign gifts and to use them for your own glory or wealth. That is why before a person can experience this kind of power in their lives, 
It is absolutely essential that they come to the cross in their own lives where they truly reckon themselves to be dead, crucified with Christ, and living now, as Paul said, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. For to me to live is Christ, and, and he is our life. When Christ, who is our life, But that's difficult today in this culture and in our society. So they were there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who gave witness unto the word of his grace, God confirming it, and granted that signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided. Part held with the Jews and part held with the apostles. Jesus said, don't think that I've come to bring peace. I've come to bring sword. There's going to be division. The gospel of Jesus Christ brings division. It brings a sharp division between people. And as was here in uh, Iconium, Part were with the apostles and part were with the Jews and thus the division and all that developed as the result of their ministry there. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, Basically, there was a lynch mob. The, the, the people that were against them decided to kill them. And as I said, they were getting outside of Roman jurisdiction pretty much. They were getting into some wild territory where it was sort of the, you know, vigilante justice kind of thing. And so they were going to put them to death. But when they became aware of this plot, they fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lies round about. So on hearing of the intention and the plot to kill them. They did the wise thing. They, they got out of there and they went on down to uh, Lystra and Derby. There is a time to stand your ground and there is a time to move on. I don't believe that God expects us to be foolhardy to take unnecessary, unwarranted uh, chances or uh, to try and be daring unless he calls us to be and then you stand. But there is a time to stand and there is a time when wisdom says, better get out of here. And upon hearing of their uh, intention of stoning them, lynching them, they decided that they would move on. And so from Iconium, they now head down to Lystra. They left Antioch under tremendous pressure. And now they're leaving Iconium under tremendous pressure. If everywhere you preached, you had to leave town in a hurry because they were out to kill you, you would probably question your call. <laughs> Has God really called me? Everywhere I go, there's a riot, you know. And 
And so we'll follow them down to Lystra and to Derby next week. And the exciting things that happened there in Lystra, but also something that shows to us the absolute fickleness of the crowd. Totally fickle. If you're seeking the glory of man, then look out. Because one day they'll put you on a pedestal and want to worship you, and the next day, they'll attempt to kill you. Look at a star baseball player when he goes into a batting slump. Before he goes into the slump, every time he comes to the plate, everybody's wild, cheering, and you know, just, and you walk up there and you feel so great, you know, the whole crowd's just cheering, I just sort of swing my bat, you know, and, and everybody's just, ah, oh, yeah, he's at bat, now watch this, you know. And, but go into a slump, for a week or so, what happens? When they call your name and you go into the batting box, everybody's booing. The fickleness of the crowd. That's why it is so foolish to seek the favor of the world. If we would live to just seek the favor of God, that's what's important. Is God pleased with me? Do I have God's approval? Am I doing that which pleases him? That's what's important. And God help us to follow after that which is important. Father, we thank you for the lessons that we can learn as we look at Paul and Barnabas in this missionary journey. And Lord, you know all about the world today in which we live. You know the skepticism. You know the unbelief, the doubts. And Lord, we love preaching your word. And we would also love to see, Lord, those signs following. We know, Lord, that you're able to overcome all kinds of obstacles, even those of a modern culture. And we would ask, Lord, in these last days, as we have the opportunity of giving one final witness to the world that is rapidly deteriorating that you Lord would confirm your word with signs following help us Lord and bring us Lord into that place of total and full commitment where we're not seeking recognition, glory, honor for ourselves, but live only to bring you glory and to exalt you before men. Lord, help our church to be everything that you want it to be. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. We are so appreciative for the work of your Holy Spirit that we've been privileged to observe. Keep us, Lord, ever on track with you. Lord, we pray that you would protect your church from the attacks of the enemy. Those that would sow discord, bring strife and division. 
Lord, let there be such a work of your spirit and may the power of the spirit be so manifested that the church might stand, Lord. And we thank you for the promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And so, Lord, we look to you tonight, the author, the finisher of our faith, having begun a good work, Lord, we're confident that you're going to continue it as we walk with you in the power of your spirit. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front again this evening. They're here to pray for you. You may need a work of God in your life. It may be that you need a miracle. It could be that this is the night God will begin working many miracles. Now, you know, I, I've, I've said that, you know, why don't we? There are, God is working and there are miracles and that we must acknowledge. God has not forsaken us, but it's just that to the same degree and extent that they had in the book, we're not there. We haven't arrived at that level. And, and then that's the level I'd like to see us coming to. And who knows? Maybe God wants to use you as that instrument to operate in that realm. Take some radical changes. Take a total commitment. Take death to the old nature, the old man, the reckoning of it to be dead. But God can do it. As Dwight Moody was challenged by the statement, the world has yet to see what God could do through one man who was totally yielded to him. Who knows? But they're here to pray for you. That God might anoint you, that God might use you, that God might help you in whatever situation you might be facing at this time. To see the power of God manifested and working in your life. So feel free to come forward as soon as we're dismissed. And may the Spirit of God just work mightily this night in your behalf. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold On behalf of the Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact the Word for Today at the Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.